Well, hello and welcome. My name is Jamie Riley. I'm a professor of communication sciences and disorders and psychology at Temple University in Philadelphia. Today, I'll be telling you a little bit about the two mountains problem, uh, a way I've been looking at some of the measurement problems uh, and some answers to questions about cognitive pupillometry. Let's get right to it. So for many of us who are pretty familiar with this method at this point, we can look back and say, well, how do we learn about pupillometry? We look to the seminal studies of Hess and Polt, Kahneman in the 1960s, early 1970s, that first showed that the pupil uh, moved in conjunction with uh, factors such as cognitive, uh, cognitive effort and arousal and interest level. So when we look at one of the first studies that really showed this effect um, was Hess and Polt uh, in 1960, which actually showed these sex effects. Uh, when females and males were viewing pictures, uh, pictures of babies, pictures of mother and baby, nude males, nude females, and versus the control of landscapes. Um, and so this, this uh, paper got extreme amount of interest because it showed that the pupil parametrically modulated with interest level, um, uh, the interest level of participants, right? So this introduced pupillometry to much of the to modern psychology. Now, what I, why I bring this up is that this recent paper um, that is, it's a preprint now, but it's gotten tons of interest on ResearchGate, um, is, uh, has shown that, um, has done a very, very tight replication of many of the studies of Hess and Polt, and shown that many of them haven't, aren't replicating very well, uh, which is basically the foundation of this field. So um, this uh, gets to, with the question of why, gets to really one of the important issues uh, in this field, that it faces many of the same measurement challenges that are that are endemic to all of psychology, experimental psychology, and that are uh, underlying the replication crisis. Um, we're going to talk about some of those challenges and how we might settle them, and then open questions in uh, in cognitive pupillometry research. So the way I've been thinking about this is sort of it's an extremely complex uh, it's an extremely complex method methodology with many questions that are and uh, issues that have really not been empirically worked out very well. But the way I think of it is it, just using a much more simple metaphor than the computational complexity that involves time series, complex time series. Really, what it boil what pupillometry boils down to is comparing uh, two aggregate mountains and saying, okay, is one mountain higher or bigger or larger than another? Right. And so what I want what uh, what I want to use is this metaphor of comparing two mountains. Right. And so I want I want you as a listener to imagine uh, that you are a geographer working on this you know fictional two dimensional planet. Um, that has two mountain ranges, the Hornbill Range and the Ibis Range. Um, and your task is to figure out, okay, which of these mountain ranges is higher or better or bigger? Um, there are some problems with that. The Ibis Range, you can see, starts under the sea. Um, the Hornbill Range looks like it's higher, but maybe the Ibis Mountains are actually have a higher base to peak. So you have to figure out some way uh, to answer that question, that fundamental question of which of the mountain range, which of the mountains are larger, right? Which is the, basically the same problem as pupillometry. So what do you do to figure, that, figure out the two mountain problem, which mountains are higher and bigger? Well, one is you can send out drones uh, and submarines. Uh, so you send out your submarine to the IBIS range and you get lots and lots of samples of, uh, of this you know, these latent variables that are data points uh, that you can then uh, that you can then interpolate across uh, to figure out a profile of each mountain in the range. So the more sampling you're going to do, the better, but you're always going to uh, you're going to face problems, right? So you send up the drones, there's going to be high winds. So some mountains you're not going to be able to sample. You send down the submarine, there's going to be crazy sea monsters that that uh, take us. You're going to have missing data. So lots and lots of assumptions about interpolating across variable, across points, uh, similar to what you would experience in pupillometry. So the first thing you send out, you get your data, you then interpolate it, you come up with you know, reasonable estimates of mountains after you've imputed missing data, and then you average the mountains in the IBIS range and the Hornbill range, right? And so at the bottom, what you see here are you know, basically what you can say is some confidence interval around an, interpol around an interpolated average uh, 
So you have an average mountain for the Ibis range and an average mountain for the Hornbill range. And those averages are corrected for where the mountains start, right? So some start at sea level, but some start much higher. Here you've corrected for the baseline of where they've started. Um, you can apply binning, so you can say like, okay, in this, in this range from zero to 0.5 kilometers, here's what the average height is. Uh, and you can still then, you can get a comparison of the mountains so you can answer your question. Now, when it boils down to it, you can say, well, what are, what are the information that I need to describe whether two mountains are different, right? So one is you can describe how high the mountains are from base to peak, right? And so here, uh, this is a common measure that we use in pupillometry, uh, which is peak amplitude or peak dilation, uh, time locked to the onset of events. Right, so you can say, okay, base to peak altitude is one parameter uh, that we can describe. You can also say this horizontal distance of uh, here, if you're looking at here, is a measure of dispersion of how long it takes to get to peak, right? And that's a variable in pupillometry we call time to peak. You can also measure this in terms of horizontal distance to the baseline. That is, you have a rise and then a decay back to where you started, right? You can measure that distance. Um, and to some extent, these variables together are encapsulated under the total area under the curve, right? So you have an event, or, you know, when we're still talking about mountains, not events, but the mountain goes up, it comes down, you can measure the total area under the curve under the mountain. And then you can measure, measure the average altitude across the mountain, right? So these are five different parameters or five different ways of describing two mountains. Um, and each tells us a little bit of different information about the mountain. Now, uh, let's talk about how we, how we actually, how this uh, metaphor applies to pupillometry research. Well, many of us, uh, when we do studies in pupillometry, we do event-related designs. And event-related designs uh, involving, uh, you have uh, stimuli, many of which are modeled as delta functions. And a delta function is such that the stimulus onset is infinitesimally short. And you have a, a an event that is evoked. You have a stimulus that's evoked from that event, right? So what you have here is raw data from a single subject time series of re continuous recording of pupil data. And what I have here in the red and green are the the onset of onsets of the marked events, right? And so when you look at a raw pupil data, raw time series of pupil data it's very, very difficult to pick up any discernible patterns. Right? So these are the onsets of one condition, red relative to another. And in this case, this is just, uh, these. this is one person listening to true and false statements about the world. Uh, Paris is the capital of England uh, versus London is the capital of England and versus true and false statements about yourself. Um, your name is Mary versus your name is John and looking at evoked responses to true and false uh, true and false statements about the world. So with that, the idea would be you have mountain ranges and you have, you have two mountain ranges, one corresponding to the red uh, questions and one corresponding to the green questions interspersed within each other in a time series. You need to extract those mountains and figure out a ways to compare them. Now, when you look at the raw data, what you can see here is you have a fairly stationary time series, right? So if you were to draw a line straight across, you don't have anything that's really, 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 really descending or ascending. Uh, when you would see that in pupillometry would be when there's increases in either a, a tonic arousal across the session or when the baseline luminance in the, in the testing room changed, right? So, you know, if you started something around here uh, and you have uh, you, the, the light got much, much darker and you dilated over time. So that would be a non-stationary time series where the dilation is progressively going up. And then you have the events embedded, uh, embedded within that. Here on the, on the y-axis, you of course have pupil diameter. Um, and with many of us who use uh, eye trackers like iLink, uh, that reports the data in arbitrary units. And we're gonna talk about this soon, about the need for uh, really sort of in, when we talk about replicating, um, uh, converting those arbitrary units to, to uh, a, a human-like measure like uh, millimeters or millimeters squared for area. Um, okay, so, um, so let's you know, get into this a bit. 
one of the uh, uh, one of the a person uh, recently in a in a uh, scientific meeting I said to me about pupilometry that said I think pupilometry is pretty easy uh, when you run an eye tracking study you just get pupil diameter for free um, and basically the complaint was I don't see why it's so difficult now this is a person who doesn't do pupilometry research and does eye tracking research and as you as you'll know many of us who use eye trackers for uh things like visual world paradigms and things like that you look at the data and you have a vector uh, of right and left eye pupil diameter and you could argue okay well you know you can use that data and just do a pupilometry study um so there are lots of compelling reasons to doubt this claim uh that it's just you get the data for free and this that pupilometry really doesn't need that many considerations to do the study one is that the, the task of pupil response indexes very, very small physiological movements. So when we look at the pupillary changes in the pupillary light evoked by the pupillary light reflex or dark reflex, uh, we have a dynamic range of the pupil response between two, about two and nine millimeters. Um, when we look at task evoked pupil responses, these are, these are responses evoked by cognitive demand and not luminance shifts. They are on about the average of 0.1 millimeters, so very, very small, an order of magnitude less than what you would see in a luminance shift. There are many, many, uh, so another complicating matter uh, in pupilometry is that there are many sources of anatomical variation and potential environmental so uh, confounds. So there's a lot of factors that cause what could look like task-evoked pupil responses that are really actually task correlated variables like the onset of a stimulus uh, producing a luminance shift or producing surprise or producing an acoustic startle reflex um, uh, or just interest and, or things like uh, things that are counterintuitive that you never thought jaw clenching uh, blinks being correlated with the onset of events right so there's lots and lots of thinking that really needs to go into and planning that needs to go into a well-designed pupilometry study uh, and then more planning steps happen in the data processing and analysis. Uh, so that we're going to talk about that soon. And then what conclusions and inferences can you make from a pupilometry study is also a complicating variable. So uh, I would I would argue to this person that pupilometry is not a very easy easy uh, modality to study. It takes a lot of careful planning to get a really pu good pupilometry study. Which again, I think is why when we when we look at the methods in this field, the methods are all over the place. Um, uh, and replication is really something that is very, very rarely done in this field. So um, again, I'll, I'll return to that. Um, OK, so let's talk then about factors. So when we talk about sort of the necessity for careful planning, there is necessity for careful planning both before, uh, during and after a pupilometry study. If you haven't read this, this article uh, from 1975 from Warren Tryon, um, uh, it's basically a list of factors that you really need to consider uh, about uh, sources of variability that look like they're causing a task of a pupil response, but really have nothing to do with the, the variable of interest. So, uh, you know, many of us here are interested in things like um, a cognitive load related to upregulation of attention for while you're hearing speech that is degraded, uh, but he uh, try and notes all of these other factors that look like that, <laughs> look like something that cognitive load, but aren't. So things like blinks are often correlated, are often task correlated, right? So uh, the other thing that happens when you have an executively demanding task, people blink more. <laughs> and those blinks happen right at the onset of stimuli. So uh, when you have these packages, like Jason Geller's package, Gazer, that like, really do a great job of interpolating across blinks and, and missing data, um, it, doesn't it doesn't take care of the fact that those blinks are happening right when, uh, right when you need to model the data most or right when you have it the most executively demanding part of your, your task. Uh, same with pupillary light and dark reflexes happening right at the onset or shift between your stimuli. Um, and then factors that are very, that p almost no one considers. So things like I, your, I, even your iris color uh, and contrast between your, your, the, the color of your iris and, and the darkness of your pupil uh, make a difference. So things like weird factors you wouldn't even think about. So like blue eyes that show uh, different rates of constriction than, than, uh, than uh, darker color pigment irises. 
Uh, incentives and motivation is another one. So uh, the fact that designing your study so that you're building in uh, incentives and motivation. Many people on your studies involve really, really boring, lots and lots of trials of hearing, say, a tone, uh, and people just zone out. They can't do it. And so when you when you when you look at that and you it, um, factor in things like fatigue waves, uh, boredom, um, and so basically people going into the resting state, uh, it's something that you have to build into your design. Lots of breaks and keeping it exciting. And even, you know, as uh, as Drew and Jonathan will probably talk about um, interacting with participants a bit while they're doing the experiment. So there are also uh, other factors that try and identify very vari variable levels of tonic arousal vary throughout the day. So people are different during the morning than they are in the afternoon, just circadian rhythms change. And then factors that another, again, people really don't think about a lot, like so uh, drink, uh, coffee drinking, so caffeine um, and drugs. So, so drugs that we all, many of us take, uh, um, influence influence the, the pupil response. Uh, the, the choice of determining monocular or binocular eye tracking and ocular dominance, which eye should we model, is also an open question. And then how do we appropriate, how do we implement appropriate baselines or do baseline correction? And we're going to talk methods wise. Uh, that's uh, something that my lab has done a bit about in how we scale responses, whether we should use linear scaling or nonlinear scaling, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So these are all factors that you need to consider before. And I, I if you haven't read the Warren Tryon's article, I think it's a very good classic sort of benchmark of 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 that you should go to because it's really just listed out like here's what here's what you need to think about caffeine and and iris color and all these things that that I never thought about before but are really sort of important. So that's before to your design, right? So some important factors to consider before your design, and then factors to consider during your design. So one is this idea of uh, idiosyncratic luminance changes, right? So one of the things that is kind of interesting about this, so people always talk about the need, the necessity for matching very, very uh, closely on luminance, maintaining isoluminance across stimuli. And I'm gonna argue that's not incredibly important if you do good baseline correction, in that this idea that, you, that we are interested in relative change from a baseline to, uh, from, base, from a baseline of a stimulus to some evoked activity. And if you have higher levels of luminance, um, higher levels of luminance in one condition relative to another, the baseline correction for that trial will correct for that difference. Now, the problem is, though, if you have idiosyncratic differences in luminance, I was thinking, OK, what would be the most idiosyncratic example of luminance just shifting randomly or stochastically that would influence that? And I think, well, like a disco ball or a, a strobe light just happening. And so, you know, I, I did go, I did what you would do Wikipedia or Google Images and I Googled, uh, uh, I did a Google disco ball. And then I found this, that there's actually a disco ball drone that you could fly around. So like, I was thinking a disco ball would be crazy for luminance and doing people on the side, but that was like a disco ball drone that flies around would be even worse. So there is that, that exists. So don't do that. Uh, don't have a disco ball drone in your, in your testing room. Uh, but factors such as things that you wouldn't think of, like looking off center. Um, so um, uh, things like your your pupil your pupil shape uh, deforms when you look off center. So really having people fixated in the middle of your screen uh, for long periods of time in, in, induces fatigue. Uh, but you need to have them looking dead on um, uh, for to get really good fidelity data. And again, this speaks to the issue of not getting data for free when you do an eye tracking study. When you do an eye tracking study, you're inter typically interested in ratios of saccades to fix, uh, fixations and people moving around. That's the last thing you want to do in a, in, a, in a pupillometry study. So looking off center and distraction and sort of mind wandering and eye wandering, is it gives you very, very poor data fidelity in a, in a, in a pupillometry study. So these are all considerations. Uh, and then after, right? So one of the big things after is where where the data crunching happens. So factors to consider after, you need to make a number of methodological decisions. And each one is not trivial. And each one people will disagree with. Uh, I think there's not good consensus on which methods we should be using. So how do we filter bad data, right? So uh, how do we know that the data are bad? You know, low pass, high pass filters. How do we aggregate good data? 
Do we bin our data or do we just, uh, do we leave it alone and model it using things like growth curve analysis? Um, many of the pack, so the, the great thing about the world right now is that so many people are, you know, embracing open science and really putting out open source software packages. Um, uh, Dr. Dennison, uh, I just discovered it has, has, it has a package which I didn't know about, which sounds great. Um, we've been using Jason Geller's package gazer, but there are others, uh, chap and pupil on are, uh, are other ones. So these will take care of some of the issues that you have in imputing missing data, but each one also incurs many of the assumptions, right? So things like velocity based interpolation, you have to really know and be able to get under the hood of these uh, these packages to know what they're doing uh, in processing your data or else you won't be able to interpret the conclusion. So uh, then one of the other big factors is, OK, well, you know, you've decided you've got your data cleaned and into time series and extracted so you, that you have two mountains, one mountain for one condition and another mountain for the other one. Which parameters of those mountains are you really going to interested in comparing? Are you interested in comparing peak, time to peak, average amplitude, area under, area under the curve? Each of those things really indexes different neurophysiological processes and cognitive processes. So figuring out which parameters you want to test and what does it mean, right? What does it mean to have a higher area under the curve um, uh, is, is also an open question. So then uh, what I'm going to talk about now briefly is how to uh, some data from our lab uh, on how to baseline correct your data. Okay, so one of the big questions, uh, and, and again, this gets to the, the replication issue in our field, is baseline scaling. So what is baseline scaling? Um, what, so I have it here, an example of showing a stairwell, right? And so a stairwell would be, you have a, if you have, say, a rising or falling time series, um, and the beginning of the stair is the baseline amplitude. So let's say you were walking up the stairs, right? And the stairs, uh, each each step, the the rise to the run, the 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 basically the how the height of the stair goes up, each stair goes up to uh, the the amount of a space that you have your foot on. Say it changes as the stairwell goes up. That would be a nonlinear system, right? So this idea that as you get higher, the stairs get smaller, right? So that's a, a nonlinear system as opposed to say a linear system where the stair goes up and that ratio of the of the rise to the run of each stair stays exactly the same. So um, so that when we talk about pupillometry, the, this, the pupillometry again has this dynamic range from two to nine millimeters. Now, depending where you start, if say your, your baseline pupil is four millimeters and you have some event, you scare someone and it goes up to 4.5 millimeters, um, that would be a raw change, an absolute value change of 0.5 millimeters. Now, uh, there's two ways you can think of that change. One would be if you look at the raw change just as, as a subtraction, it's 0.5 millimeters. But there are many, many past studies, and we've looked at this, did a count of this, a rough count of it, basically 30 to 40% of studies before about 2010 used proportional baseline scaling, which is nonlinear scaling technique. And what that would be is if you say, okay, you know, we have a 0.5 millimeter change, but you started at your, the baseline at two millimeters, that's a 25% change. But if you model the same raw change from six millimeters, it's an 8% change, right? So proportional scaling, you can have the same exact magnitude pupil response, but it's a very different proportion of change depending on where the baseline where you started. So you have to, in order to compare across participants with different baseline pupil sizes, you have to baseline correct for their, for, their, for their starting size. Now, the question is, how do you do it, right? One way, uh, you, uh, one way you could do it would be using nonlinear baseline scaling techniques like proportional scaling. And the idea with this, it wouldn't necessarily be totally unreasonable to do that. So many biological signals have nonlinear response properties. And that follows the law of initial values, one of the sort of hallmarks of psychophysics. The idea with the law of initial values is that the, amp the amplitude of an evoked response dampens as a function of the baseline. Uh, and you can think a bit about this uh, as in something like your heart rate, right? If your heart rate is very high, and so if you're, if you're frightened, let's say, um, and you're hyper aroused, uh, and then a dog jumps out and barks at you, 
you're not you and you're already high your 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 reaction to that is not going to be proportionately the same as if you were very very low when a dog barked at you basically your resp your heart rate response to that is going to be much smaller than it was down below right and so that's a nonlinear response modality you have much much higher uh signal intensity boost lower on than you do it when the amplitude's already high um and that's modeled that's modeled in things like hearing acuity heart rate galvanic skin response and these are these are either you know the way you would scale the response would be using proportional methods or more likely with with power functions right so many biological signals involve power functions some biological signals however scale pretty linearly so when we look at things like the hemodynamic response function that we model in fmri the hrf it tends to have canonical linear response properties that is basically it's it's the same canonical response that looks a lot like a pupil task of a pupil response uh regardless of where you are in the brain and regardless of where of the of the signal amplitude where you're starting and the good thing about that is it allows you to model the response using uh, deconvolution techniques, uh, using mathematical techniques that always look for the same shape of the signal. If it was nonlinear, the signal shape would change depending on where you start it. So this is what line linearity buys us, right? So it basically allows us to compare across different baseline pupil amplitudes. It allows us to compare across different luminous luminance if we baseline correct uh, for where someone started. So briefly, I'll talk a little bit about two experiments and actually looking that we did and actually looking at whether the pupil response scales linearly. Um, so uh, in this paper, uh, in Behavior Research Methods, we published last year, we looked at whether the pupil response scales linearly or nonlinearly um, by manipulating the baseline pupil amplitude. So basically what we did is uh, we did the reverse of what a normal pupillometry study is. And so the normal pupillometry study is in experimental design is you hold luminance constant so that you basically maintain a, a very stable baseline um, uh, pupil amplitude. And then you manipulate some task demand, some cognitive task demand, right? Harder and easier or two different conditions, easy or hard math problems, right? And so the idea is you look to see whether the um, whether the manipulate, cognitive manipulation did change the pupil response, right? So what we did in this experiment was we flipped that logic. We kept the cognitive task demands the same, but we changed the luminance. Um, so we tested people in a dark room, a very, very dark room, or a very, very bright room. And we kept the, we kept the um, task demands the same. People, people in this experiment, what they were doing was they were counting pure tones. So they were hearing uh, sequences of pure tones, do, 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 do. And they had to maintain a running count of what they were hearing to give you an account of the number of tones they heard at the end of it. And we modeled pupillary responses at each tone switch point. So the idea is people didn't know what we, what we were doing, right? We were modeling the, the task of a pupil response at each switch point between tones but we didn't really care about what they what they said about the count of the, about the number of tones they heard. So in this, what we have is we have the pupil, the baseline pupil response in the very dark condition starting high, uh, five millimeters or so, and in the very bright condition where pe the pupils are constricting, it starts very low. Uh, and we look at whether the evoked pupil responses are the same uh, in terms whether they're the same whether you start in a bright room or a dark room. Um, so when we do that, when we when we look at the data across 27 participants, this is the uh, yellow is the bright condition and the black is the dark condition. They're very, very similar. So when we run Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian ANOVAs, uh, there is basically no evidence for uh, for difference, um, no amplitude differences, no peak amplitude differences. So when we look here, it looks like they're somewhat a little bit different. Our reviewers were like, well, I don't know, that looks a little bit different to me, but they're not. Uh, so with that, the idea is when you look at the baseline, uh, it looks like the regardless of the baseline that you started, whether you start at five millimeters or 2.3 millimeters, you have the same uh, raw total, basically raw or absolute value amplitude change of the pupil response, which suggests linearity. We did a follow up experiment where we looked at 42 participants and we did a word monitoring task. Um, 
where we had people look here uh, viewing streams of words and they had to hit a button every time they saw one of the target words which were boot hawk and desk uh, and we looked at foils in dark uh, in very very dark very medium and very bright light um, so we added a different condition and so what we found here is the same exact thing right so when we do in the very bright light uh, the midtone light and the dark light is exact is very very is equivalent um, regardless of the baseline pupil response that you started at you show the same raw amplitude evoke change uh, and this suggests that there is uh, that the pupil the, that the pupil response the task evoke pupil response is linear and not nonlinear and so what does that mean well you know if you if when we look at things like pupil uh, studies that have done pr proportional scaling. I don't know what it means. It means probably a lot of them are wrong, right? And this gets to the, this issue of there's very, very little replication studies in pupillometry. I, I know very few. Uh, and that really sort of, it's very difficult to trust when you look at a pupillometry study, whether it's right or not, um, which is, you know, a fundamental issue. So, um, uh, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, we, you know, basically the summary of the research, some of your, our empirical research is that the task of a pupil response does appear to be linear. Uh, and the conclusion with that is that you should use subtractive methods as opposed to nonlinear correction methods. And you should always baseline correct your data, I think. Um, uh, there are going to be, um, you know, we can talk about alternatives using the growth curve and, and other and convolution techniques. I think some of the other speakers are, are addressing that. Um, uh, and we'll be interested to discuss that. So the last thing, so revisiting the two mountain problem. I identified five different parameters or differences in talking about characterizing a mountain. The trick with this is we know very, very little about the neurophysiological correlates of each of those parameters. So we know that when pe when there are hard math problems, uh, your peak re peak your peak pupillary response is higher than your a little bit goes a little bit higher. But we don't know that we don't have a neurophysiological representation of what that means, right? So does it mean your your locus ceruleus is working a little bit harder uh, and sort of um, modulating the system? What does it mean to have a, a faster time to peak? Um, what does it mean to have a lo a longer decay? What does it mean that when we look at aging, the time to peak is lower um, and the peak amplitude is lower? Um, we really don't really have a firm idea, uh, you know, a good neurobiological model of what the components of the two mountain problem are. So when we when we choose these parameters, we're really sort of shooting in the dark about about what it means, about what the biological representation of it means. Um, we know it has something to do with effort, but it might also have something to do with arousal. It might have something to do with cognitive load. It might have something to do with surprise. It might have something to do with interest and motivation. And probably to some extent, there's shared variance across those, but we really ha don't have much knowledge about separating the two. So it's interesting, you know, for a field that is, you know, over 60 or so years old, it has a, a number, thousands and thousands of different studies. We really haven't done the foundational research in figuring out what exactly we are measuring. Um, and so these are some of the open questions uh, involved in that. Um, so uh, I will um, leave it, I will, I will leave it at that. Um, and thank you for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. I thank you, uh, thank you all. And uh, these are, uh, some of the great people I work with, uh, especially Dr. Peel. Um, uh, thank you all.